Gastrointestinal Diagnostics An abdominal x-ray is an imaging test to look at the organs and structures in the abdomen. This would include the spleen, the stomach, intestines, and when the test is done to look at the bladder and kidneys, it's called a KUB, kidneys, ureters, bladder. A lower gastrointestinal series, also called a barium enema, is used to examine and diagnose problems with the colon, the large intestine. The x-rays are taken while the barium sulfate fills the colon via the rectum. A CT of the abdomen and pelvis is a diagnostic test used to help detect diseases of the small bowel, colon, and internal organs and determine cause of unexplained pain. So consider allergies that you would ask for a patient that would have a contrast scan. So allergies to iodine or seafood can cause a cross allergic reaction to the contrast dye used for the CT scans. Scintigraphy is a technique in which a scintillion counter or similar detector is used with a radioactive tracer to obtain an image of a bodily organ or a record of its functioning. In this picture, it's showing the increased tracer concentration in the central abdomen, where the arrow is, corresponding to the small bowel. An abdominal ultrasound is used to look at organs in the abdomen, including the liver, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, and kidneys. The blood vessels that lead to some of these organs, such as the inferior vena cava and aorta, can also be examined with an ultrasound. Different instructions would include for an ultrasound of the liver, gallbladder, spleen, or pancreas, you would tell the patient not to drink for 8 to 12 hours prior to the ultrasound, but they could eat a fat-free meal the evening before. For the kidneys, they would need to drink 4 to 6 glasses of liquids before the ultrasound but no eating 8 to 12 hours before to avoid gas buildup in the intestines. And if it was for the aorta, there would be no eating 8 to 12 hours before the test. A manometry is also known as esophageal testing, and it measures the pressures and the pattern of the muscle contractions in the esophagus. Abnormalities in the contractions and strength of the muscle or in the sphincter at the lower end of the esophagus can result in pain, heartburn, or difficulty swallowing. An upper endoscopy is a procedure that is done under anesthesia and enables a viewing of the lining of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. It provides a look to see if a patient has, for example, erosive esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, a duodenal ulcer, or gastric ulcer. A colonoscopy, which is a lower GI endoscopy, is also done under anesthesia. The flexible tube with the camera is inserted through the anus to examine the large intestine and the end of the small intestine at the terminal ileum. Biopsies may be collected to examine and it is also done to remove polyps and to manage GI bleeding. A camera endoscopy allows examination of the small intestine using a small video capsule that is about the size of a large vitamin. The camera captures pictures as it travels naturally through the small intestine and transmits images to a small device outside the body. After the procedure is completed, the images can be downloaded and reviewed by the physician. The capsule passes out in the stool. Patients should not have an MRI within 30 days of having a camera endoscopy. An endoscopic retrograde choleangiopancreatography is a test done to look at problems in the bile and pancreatic ducts. This is especially for complex or repeated cases of pancreatitis or disorders of the bile ducts. Flexible tube with a camera and light are passed through the mouth to the small intestine. A dye is injected through the catheter to take a look at the pancreatic and biliary ducts. A double balloon enteroscopy is also known as a push-pull enteroscopy or a double bubble, and it's an endoscopic technique that allows a panenteric or more complete examination of the small bowel. Carcinoembryonic antigen measures the amount of protein that may appear in the blood of some people who have certain types of cancers, especially cancer of the large intestine, colon, and rectal cancer. It may also be present in people with cancer of the pancreas, breast, ovary, or lung. Certain blood tests would be performed initially to look for antibodies specific to celiac disease. Immunoglobulin A, IgA, anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody is the single preferred test for detection of celiac disease. If abnormal elevated levels of IgA and anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies are found, a person almost certainly has celiac disease. The fecal occult blood test is a test done to check for stool samples for hidden blood. Occult blood in the stool may indicate colon cancer or polyps in the colon or rectum, though not all cancers or polyps bleed. 
Typically, a cold blood is passed in such small amounts that it can only be detected through chemicals used in the fecal occult blood test. If blood is detected through the fecal occult blood test, then more testing would need to be done to determine the source of bleeding. This test can only detect the presence or absence of blood. It does not indicate potential sources of bleeding. A stool sample can provide valuable information about problems in the stomach, intestine, rectum, or other parts of the gastrointestinal system. In an ova and parasites exam, they would view the sample of stool under a microscope to look for parasites in their ova, which is their eggs, or cysts, which are hard shells that protect some parasites at certain stage in their life cycle. This test is done if there is a possible parasitic infection and it would be noted with symptoms such as diarrhea for an extended period of time, blood or mucus in the stool, abdominal pain, nausea, headaches, or fever. This would be especially if there is an outbreak of a parasitic illness at, say, at a child's school or daycare center. Another consideration would be if the family recently visited a developing country.